So selecting content is always just culling over the internet with your coffee in the morning and seeing who's talking about what. But as useless as many people think Facebook is, it's really great for academics to form private little groups. And I have, I am a member of several little groups that are dedicated to different things. One is Women Plus in theater. So we are talking about issues that affect feminine voices and other bodies in theater that aren't masculine. Um, another group is specifically for non-tenured professors to air their grievances and woes to the world privately. <laughs> but one of my favorite groups is one that is comprised of mostly academics and a few academics at heart who gather articles and share interesting information. Um, and it was formed by Dr. Brian Herrera, who teaches uh, Latinx theater and American history. And so a lot of his articles that he's looking at also relate to my classes. And so he kind of sparked that idea in me that I was allowed to start gathering things and just stashing them away like a squirrel hides their nuts, just to make sure that I have all the things that I could possibly need. And even if I'm not going to use that for my students, it's still informing me in a way that I'm connecting dots myself as we move forward in this 21st century. And I started realizing that since there was so much out there and most of it was written by non-traditional voices, why wouldn't that be a really good basis to have a text? So in winter 2017, a lot of us know that the Me Too movement became kind of international and very suddenly on everyone's radars. Um, and that was started by a tweet from Alyssa Milano. Um, the movement itself had actually started in 2006 by a woman named Tarana Burke, who is um, a fierce feminist and dedicated person of color to creating voice for women and people of color to have a place and space to talk about sexual assault on their bodies. Um, However, Alyssa Milano tweeted this and the response was the Me Too response, um, which then was the beginning of Harvey Weinstein being called out and Bill Cosby. They were men who had been considered heroes in Hollywood and they were being called out what felt like sometimes two and three times a day. And then I started seeing it in articles about um, regional theaters where these men who had been the artistic directors for years and years and years and highly respected were now being called out for sexual assault. And the biggest difference was that people were listening. Um, and because this was happening within the realm of entertainment and Hollywood and theater, which are subjects that I teach, I was seeing a lot of articles about this. Um, and probably the most influential one that really snapped and made me believe that we needed to change the way we thought was an uh, article that Molly Ringwald wrote about The Breakfast Club, uh, viewing The Breakfast Club with her child, her now teenage child, um, in a post Me Too movement and the repercussions it had. And I read it and I thought, my gosh, every single student I know needs to read this in relation to film, in understanding when they are watching The Breakfast Club or The Graduate or Rushmore or any of these beloved um, coming of age stories that they need to have access to this article so they can understand why we adored it so much and that there was nothing else. Even though it was being created, it just wasn't being showcased by people in Hollywood because people in Hollywood don't back things that aren't gonna be blockbusters. Um, so I thought that was really important that we had that information. And I realized that if it was that easy to find, that all these other articles were also really easy to find and published and for use. Why wouldn't we not only show them this information so that we could teach film in a different way, but also so that they could see the research process. We spend a lot of time talking to them about how they need to cite their references or source their references or give credit to where credit is due. Yet we are constantly researching things as professors and giving lectures and not telling them where we're getting our information so what if they saw that whole thought process? And I started, that's what started the pieces. So thanks, Molly, you're great. So one of the most important things that we recognize in teaching film or humanities in general is that everyone has a relationship to it. 
and certainly everyone has a relationship to it now. I, I, okay, not everybody. Somebody might have been raised in a home that was non-traditional, that didn't have electricity and didn't study these kinds of things. However, they probably have heard of Shakespeare or they have probably heard of stories. And stories have been around since the beginning of humankind. It's important to find that connection between modern society and the foundation of society as we understand it. And it's important to do it in a way that is culturally relevant and open and not appropriating from anyone else. And the only way we can really do that is if we understand that story is the basis, that this idea that we need to hear these stories and we need to feel catharsis um, is what m makes us all human in a way. And it actually helps create empathy, I think, on a different level, that we all understand we have shared common experiences, shared common desires and needs. And so we create this empathy for each other. And that's kind of, I think, an important thing to educate young adults in.